Good morning, everyone. Or should I say good evening to wherever you are. Welcome to the final day of the Adobe Code Fusion Developer Week. What a week it has been. Uh, we had had phenomenal attendance across, uh, you know, we had close to 4,000 uh, attendees and the participation has been mind blowing. We had had some great speakers, but I think we had reserved the best for the last day. Uh, today we have Brian Klaas, uh, who is an amazing guy with AWS. Also, he has been a great, great friend of ours. Like, uh, he has always been there to help the cold fusion community, help the marketing team, help the product team to test out various things. He's always there with his feedback about how things has to be. And uh, we rely on, rely on him quite a bit. If he had been to Summit, you would have known he has been always been part of the content committee. And it has always been a pleasure working with him. Uh, so, Brian, thank you for all that you do. And thank you, Kishore. All right, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Hopefully you can all see my screen at this point in time. Um, if I could get like uh, confirmation, yep. So, okay, cool. Um, wonderful, well, good morning uh, to, or good afternoon or good evening or good night, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Brian Kloss and today I'm gonna be talking about um, Amazon Simple Storage Service, but not the basics of Simple Storage Service, not at all. I wanna try and talk about things you may not be aware of in S3. Um, because our good friend S3 um, is really the, some people like to call it the, the file system for the web, right? Lots of lots and lots of companies use S3, use it every day. It's extraordinarily powerful. Uh, as companies as big as Netflix and Airbnb, Spotify, Pinterest, Reddit, and then also uh, our friends in the pharmaceutical industry at, at Pfizer and, and NASA. And they're not just using it for storing like images, right? Obviously you're like, oh, Pinterest, it's everybody's images. No, they're using it to store tons of documents, tons of data, petabytes upon petabytes of data every minute are being ingested into S3. There's over 420,000 companies around the world that use S3 and it's really kind of the hub of the internet and it's awesome and powerful and it's fast. And just to give you the sense of, of the size of the scope of S3 in terms of what goes on inside of that, um, S3 in a single region, and there are right now I think 35 or maybe 36 regions, geographical regions around the world where S uh, AWS operates, um, S3 will manage 60 terabits of data per second, just in S3 in each region, region on an average day. So you can imagine how that jumps up uh, when uh, it's prime day or it's the day after say Christmas in the US or you know, uh, what, the red envelope day in China. There's lots of days on which the spikes to you know, more than uh, you know, 200 terabits, 300, 400 terabits a second of data that are going out in S3. And if I could, I would go back in time and rewrite, uh, redo all my applications to have all used S3 for all of my file and data storage from the beginning. And I could because we've had CF Cold Fusion and, and uh, S3 integration since Cold Fusion 9, right? It's really easy to work with S3 from our Cold Fusion runtimes um, because this has been around since Cold Fusion 9. Basically, instead of pointing to a local directory, we say S3 colon slash slash, right? instead of saying C colon slash slash or a, a file share on your network or something like that. And all of the tags and all of the functions um, exist in terms of accessing S3 and reading and writing files, which is really cool. But there's so much more available that goes beyond uh, what was available in Cold Fusion 9 and 11 and 2016 and 2018. There's so many more things and that's really what I'm gonna talk about. I'm, I'm gonna assume uh, that you know the basics of S3 and Amazon Web Services. Like you know what a bucket is and you know about the access key and the secret key, the basics of accessing S3 through Cold Fusion. I'm not really gonna go th through that um, right today. I'm gonna look at more of some of the, the things that you may not be aware other than file storage uh, that S3 can do and does really well. Um, and you know what I'm gonna show today uh, is really mostly things in uh, in CF 2021, but prior to Cold Fusion 2021, um, yeah, Derek, do not just make everything public. Please do not just make everything public. I'll talk about how to get around that if you're worried and you don't know. 
Uh, but prior to Cold Fusion 2021, um, we would uh, you would have to pretty much just access this advanced functionality through the AWS Java SDK. SDK, excuse me. It's really easy to work with. The other Brian, Brian B, talked about yesterday actually using other services other than S3 or DynamoDB or SQS and SNS. Those that are built into Cold Fusion 21. He talked about how you could access other services through the AWS Java SDK in Cold Fusion 2021. Um, but for this advanced functionality with S3 that I'm going to talk about today, you you have to use, in prior to 2021, or even if in, you're in 2021, you'd have to access the Java SDK directly. And um, I have a an app uh, that I uh, built and I've used, and I've, when I've talked at other conferences, talked about this a lot, it's my little AWS Playbox app. Um, and it, it's you can see the URL here. I will show this URL later on. It'll be available in the recording, and I'll post my slides on my website. Um, where you can play around and see examples of using these features, all of these features I'm going to talk about today inside of Cold Fusion 2018 or even uh, 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 Cold Fusion 11 or 2016 as well. So uh, I'm not going to go into that code today because today, instead, I really want to focus on Cold Fusion 2021 um, because it has native support for S3 and Azure Blob services. Again, I'm not going to talk about Azure. I'm, I'm an AWS person. Um, but again, this is built in natively. So you don't need to add the AWS Java SDK uh, to um, uh, your CFusion lib directory, you get all the power of using the AWS Java SDK directly with a fraction of the code. And I'll show you some examples of that. You know, it's the old story as the video showed that it started, the session started, you know, it's the old story of making hard stuff simple, right? That's what it is. And again, you can do all the stuff I'm going to show in earlier versions of Cold Fusion using the AWS Java SDK, but today I'm going to focus on CF 2021, all right? And today I'm going to talk about four things, four basic sort of main areas, well, kind of five, but mostly four. So security, money, power, and all the other stuff very briefly that uh, AWS can do. Um, but before I get to that, I do need to talk about if you're going to use S3, Simple Storage Service, in Cold Fusion 2021, uh, I need to quickly go over the basics of working with AWS services or even Azure services, because it's the same thing, in Cold Fusion 2021. Um, and so what you need to do first is you need to make sure that the AWS S3 package is installed inside of Cold Fusion 2021. Now remember, CF 2021 is highly modular, modularized, hard word to say. So not all the packages, not all the functionality of Cold Fusion may be installed by default. If you do the, like the quick express install, you get like the admin and the basic runtime and nothing else. And so Cold Fusion 2021's support for S3 is part of a package. Um, it's called AWS S3. So you have to install that first if you're using Cold Fusion 2021. You need to do that. And you can do that via the CF administrator. There's a nice GUI where you click on a button and it installs it. Uh, you can run um, cfpm.bat. That's in your CF home uh, CFusion bin directory. It's a little command line interface to the installing modules for Cold Fusion. And uh, if you're using Command Box to start up your servers, either locally or in production, you can actually run a command called CFPM, which runs the CFPM bat file uh, when your server started up. So you have to install the package first. And then you have to configure the service. Uh, and again, there's multiple ways of doing this. You have to be able to say, here's how we're actually going to connect to AWS. You can do it in the Cold Fusion Administrator. You can do it in your application CFC, uh, or you can do it in line uh, in your Cold Fusion CFM pages. I recommend from a security perspective, either in the CF admin or an application CFC. Um, it's easiest for me to show it in application CFC because I think it's closest to what is the ideal. And I think the most ideal way to configure your connection to AWS is to put it in a configuration C CFC uh, that gets instantiated as a singleton, meaning only one exists, on your application startup using a framework like Coldbox or Wirebox. I think that's the best way to do it. But if you don't use a framework, then use application CFC. So that's what I'm going to show you here today. So this is what it looks like. Um, in op on application start, you would set up your credentials. You need to provide the vendor name. In this case, it's AWS. The other option right now is Azure. Uh, you say, specify the region. That is one of those geographic, one of the 35 geographic data centers around the world that a AWS has. And then you provide your access key and your secret key um, there. And those you would have to generate inside of AWS itself. And that's the credentials. That's saying, here I am. Here's my authorization, right? Or, sorry, this is my authentication, not authorization, authentication to access AWS. US. And then you would also create a structure called your, your app, in this case, S3 configuration, in which you're just basically saying, hey, it's the here's the service name, and the service name is S3. 
And then you call a function called get cloud service and you pass it in your credentials, you pass it in your configuration, and there you go. That is your reusable connection to S3. You do the same thing if you're using SNS, you do the same thing if you're using SQS or DynamoDB, you would just pass in a different service name uh, there. So, uh, you know, again, what I like about this approach is flexibility, uh, doing it in application CFC or doing it in a singleton that controls your, um, your connections to AWS or, or Azure, because you can provide different credentials and service configurations as needed, right? Because it's best practice, it's absolutely best practice in AWS or Azure or anywhere else not to use a single account for everything. Don't use a single account for everything. Um, we started on that path and discovered there's also, I mean, it's, it's, it's not good, right? Because you want to limit your security blast radius in case someone gets access to your keys, you know, your, your access key and your secret key. You don't want to say, oh, do everything in AWS because you could wake up with a $50,000 bill. If that if those credentials become compromised somewhere, you want to really limit the roles in AWS, the things you can do in AWS. Um, so you want to have you know one account set up for one set of functionality in your app, and another account for another set of functionality in your app. And doing this in application CFC or in an AWS service configuration object at app startup time lets you do that. So that's why I'm focusing on app CFC here. And then once you actually get that set up, there's sort of a basic pattern to working with S3 in Cold Fusion 2021. And that is you get a reference to the bucket. And again, the bucket is that sort of key thing that it's a, think of it like a site, like an FTP site that you put there too. You create a structure, structure of options, and then you call a method of that bucket object using the option struct, and then Cold Fusion sort of translates and does everything else for you. It's pretty straightforward. So let me give you an example of what this looks like um, uploading a file, right? So this is an uploading a file in Cold Fusion 2021, right? You start with the same pattern. You get a reference to the bucket. You can see there the first line, application.s3 service object.bucket, and you pass in the service the bucket name, uh, whatever your bucket might name be named. Uh, you create a structure of options appropriate to that method. So in this case, uh, uh, for an upload request, I need a source file, which is my local file I'm going to upload, and I need a key. And an S3, a key is the identifier for the file for the object, because S3 is not file storage, it's object storage. So the key is just the reference for it there. Uh, and then you say, my bucket, upload the file, and you pass it in that struct, and there you go. That's how you upload a file to S3 in Cold Fusion 2021. And if you look at the docs, which I have to say are really quite thorough um, for um, um, for, for the CF integration, if you look on Adobe's website and look at the docs for the, the AWS integration and certainly the S3 integration for it, you'll see some really weird names in there. You know, like why is it called key and not, you know, destination file name? Well, these things are really specific to S3, how AWS works. Um, and, and Adobe is trying to get you aligned with how uh, AWS works in that, that way. So again, you know, there's no files in S3, there are simply objects and keys. And the key in this case is a file name, but it can also include uh, paths or whatever to the file uh, in the S3 bucket. Because again, S3 doesn't even have directories, it has paths that are sort of translated in the key. So anyways, that's, that's a little introduction to how you work with um, the, the, the AWS service in Cold Fusion 2021. You'll see this pattern repeated a lot for the rest of the presentation. So let's move on. All right, so let's talk about security because everyone wants to be secure, right? We want, we're worried about security. We wanna make sure our stuff is secure. Uh, and I can't talk at all about security without, <laughs> I really can't talk about anything in AWS uh, with rega regarding security or doing anything in AWS without talking about identity access management or IAM. So IAM is the system that says this person, this user, this site, this server, this service, whatever it is, this thing has permission to do this on this. That's how IAM works. This thing has permission to do this on this. Uh, and and IAM is big and complicated. And you know, one of the real limitations of using Cold Fusion support in Cold Fusion, sorry, support for S3 in Cold Fusion 2018 and earlier is you had to um, really give a broad swath of permissions, a really big swath of permissions, like S3 dot, you know, star, which you don't ever want to do star on anything, right? Means wildcard, match everything. And one of the real advantages of using the AWS Java SDK directly has been that you can say, oh no, I don't want to have permissions for everything. I want a really limited number of permissions only on this bucket right here. And that gives you the ability to really limit, again, your blast radius and prevent people from doing things that you don't want them to do. Um, I don't have time to go in 
into I am a lot. It's a really complicated topic. I think I did a pretty good job at CF Summit in 2019, uh, where I talked about I am and talked about users and roles and talked about permissions and uh, how to scope things correctly. Um, you can see it on YouTube. The link is right there. Again, these slides will be posted. This recording will be posted. Don't worry if you don't get the link right now, um, but you'll be able to. I, th I think it's a pretty good introduction. There's a lot of really good other introductions. Brigitte Nielsen is the head of developer relations for IAM. She works at AWS. She gives amazing, clear, beautifully precise talks um, on IAM. If you, and you're going to need to learn it. I won't say if you need to learn it. You're going to need to learn it sooner or later. So um, please understand that the things I'm showing you here today are dependent on your ability to actually do these things in AWS, which means setting up the correct permissions. I just don't have the time to go over that today. All right. So back to the main topic. First thing I'm going to talk about in security is time expiring URLs. So links to your files in S3. Uh, yeah, it, it was 2019, and it's, I think it's still it, it's still a very applicable talk because fortunately I am doesn't change very much. Yeah. So time expiring URLs are super critical for keeping your files secure because you do not if you. You do not want public read buckets. Let me repeat that one more time. No more public read buckets. Let me make this as emphatic as I can. Don't do this. People will find your data and people will still steal it. If you have public write buckets, woe to you because you will literally wake up one morning and find that there are petabytes of data in there. Don't do public read buckets. And time expiring URLs are the simplest and easiest way for you to have private buckets that people can still access based on the permissions you give them to do so uh, from your cold from your cold fusion server. So, you know, really again the point of time expiring URLs or pre-signed requests as AWS calls them is they allow you to secure your content so that somebody can't just you know, point to it on their website, right? If you have a video, if you have an image, you have a PDF, you have an Excel file, you have a Word document, whatever it is, they can't just point to it from their website because you provide a URL that expires after a certain period of time. So this lets you do all sorts of things like limit access to downloads. Like if you're like, okay, you're gonna buy this music file, you're gonna buy this video. Well, you only have, you give them the URL, they click on it and they only have five minutes before that URL expires. And what's really cool about pre-signed URLs in AWS is that if they expire in while you're like downloading the file, it's like it, it breaks the file transfer immediately in the background. Um, so like they're really strict about the time there. It also lets you do other things like change file name, special specify inline attachment or uh, inline or attachment disposition for downloading. Um, and there's also an option in pre-signed URLs for doing a pre-signed put, meaning putting something in S3 as opposed to a pre-signed get. And what's great about pre-signed puts is that you can upload files directly to S3 bypassing your cold fusion server entirely. And that is wonderful because we all know that one of the challenges of Tomcat, the underlying engine in CF, is that you know, and as you upload bigger and bigger files, it needs more and more memory on the server to accept those bigger files. You don't have to worry about this at all if you're uploading your files directly to S3 and bypassing your cold fusion server and time expiring URLs let you do that. So uh, one of the great, so this is how you do a pre-signed get, not a put, but a pre-signed get inside of Cold Fusion 2021. It's the same pattern we saw before. We get, an, uh, we get a reference to our, our uh, S3 service object that we created on application startup there, giving it the bucket name. And then we say, give me a get request. And we say how long we want that request to be valid for. In this case, I'm doing two hours. You can do anything from one second, which is not very useful, all the way up to seven, uh, seven days. Pre-signed URLs only are valid for up to seven days. That's the maximum that AWS allows. And then you give it the key name, the path to the file on in your S3 bucket. And then you say, okay, my bucket, generate get pre-signed URL. And you pass it in that, that structure that defines your pre-signed pre URL get request. And then you get back in the response a, a string called signed URL. And you can put that in an href tag. You can paste to have people paste it directly in the browser, whatever it is. And that link is valid until it expires. And at that point, that link is no longer valid. It's cryptographically signed. People can't get to it anymore. So it's super powerful. It's a great way of keeping your app, uh, your buckets and the content in your buckets secure without a lot of overhead. It's I, In my experience, it's really the simplest way of getting people to allow to access your objects uh, on uh, S3 while making them private in the background there. Now, if you have Cold Fusion 2018 or earlier, um, 
I have a set of utilities on GitHub, again, at github.com slash Brian Kloss. These are called the CTL S3, S3 utils. Uh, these allow you to do digital signing uh, for both um, uh, straight requests to S3, as well as to Amazon CloudFront, which is their global content distribution network. You can use these. Uh, it, it, it makes it really easy to do this in ColdFusion 2018 and earlier. Uh, we run a mix of 2018 and 2021 in our 2018 servers. We use this all the time. And so really, I have to say, if you, if you take one thing away from this presentation, if you do one thing different after this present presentation, let it be this. Make your buckets private and sign all the links to your files in your buckets. Just do that. It will make a vast difference in the security of your files and objects, I should say, uh, in S3. All right, next up, encrypting objects at rest, because a lot of people are like, well, if somebody does get into my credentials and somebody does get into my S3 bucket, I don't want them to be able to see the sensitive data that's in there, right? And so you want to be able to encrypt objects at rest. And Cold Fusion 2021 and the AWS Java SDK lets you do this. Now. Um, AWS provides three different ways of encrypting objects at rest. There's an AWS managed way. Uh, there is a way where you can provide your own manage your own master keys uh, stored in a service called Key Management Service that AWS offers. And you can also do encryption using your own uh, keys and your own sort of key vault and setup. Unless you have really strict regulatory requirements use AWS's S3 encryption. It is so much simpler. It is so much easier to do. It's transparent encryption and decryption when you need to get those files, because otherwise you have to do the decryption yourself. Um, and AWS is, again, very, very secure. It encrypts each object with a unique key. And as an additional safeguard, um, uh, you know, it encrypts the key itself with a master key that AWS rotates regularly. It uses AES-256 encryption. It's a good thing. Yeah, it's really great. It's easy to do. And John, I, I get it. I get the idea about vendor lock-in. I do, you know, but the fact of the matter is, is I think vendor lock-in is kind of a myth. Um, you are choosing AWS. You are choosing to be locked into that vendor. It is as simple as that. Uh, you choose Azure, you're choosing to be locked into Azure, you're choosing Google Cloud Platform or, or Oracle, you are making choices about how you want your stuff to work. There are similar APIs, you know, even Cloudflare with a new R2 service has an S3 compatible, uh, you know, backend, but they're going to do stuff that's going to lock you into uh, their services. So, uh, you know, I think you just need to be very careful. I, I, I'm not, I'm not afraid of vendor lock it, right? Because it's going to be a big old rewrite no matter what. And AWS is not going out of business tomorrow. Tomorrow. And AWS has, in my in my long experience with them, and and since really since they've been around, they have deprecated one service, one service they have deprecated, and that was um, Amazon Sumerian, which was their three D avatar creation service, which didn't go anywhere. One service out of the almost three hundred they offer, I'm not worried about them going away for lock in. So yeah, no, I get it, I get it. Afraid is not the same thing as due diligence, and you have to make that decision. For me and my team. AWS was the way to go. You may have other requirements that push you towards Azure or Google Cloud, because you may have customers who are like, look, I don't want to be on AWS because AWS competes with me on some fundamental level. Totally get that. Totally get that. Um, I, you know, I'm in the position where uh, I don't have to worry about vendor lock-in, really, because it's a decision that I made. And I, I assume I don't have to worry about vendor lock-in anytime soon, but we'll see, right? But I totally get your concern. And I'm, I'm sorry if I came across as diminishing it, because it's not, not trying to diminish it at all. So. Anyways, so again, I think you know using the Amazon. Uh, uh, thank you, John. Um, I, I believe that you know using the service Amazon managed server side encryption is just simple and easy. I don't want to worry about managing encryption, right? It's one of the reasons we use cloud vendors is to not have to worry about the sort of underlying stuff and the 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 you know encryption, decryption, security, all those other things. Although that's kind of our job a little bit. But anyways, let me show how easy it is to encrypt objects at rest in uh, Cold Fusion 2021. In this case, you do the upload request. This is just like uploading a file, except in the upload request, you specify one more property and that's server-side encryption. And in this case, it's called AES-256 server-side encryption. It's a, it's a Java constant. If you look in the AWS Java SDK, you can see that, but this is how easy it is to turn on server-side encryption. And when you request the file from S3 using the same set of credentials or credentials that have uh, similar uh, uh, permissions, it will automatically decrypt it for you. That is really simple and really easy. This is what it looks like in Cold Fusion 2018 and earlier. This is what you have to do in Cold Fusion 2018. It's a little more complex and verbose, right? So compare this to this. 
for doing uploading files. So again, one of the nice things about the native support for S3 and other AWS services is that you get, uh, it, it just makes things much, much simpler there. Um, yeah, so a, I get it. Yeah, pricing is an issue. Um, and generally pricing in the cloud goes down. AWS hasn't really dropped their prices on S3 in a while. And I'll talk about pricing actually really, really soon. I promise that. Um, but yeah, it is the fact that there is, this is something that a lot of people who work in AWS are very, are very displeased about the fact that there are no pr uh, price spend controls in AWS. Uh, you can set up alerts, but that alert at a thousand dollars can go off. And by the time you see that alert, you could be owe AWS 5,000 or $50,000, depending on how it is. So yeah, I think it's one of the real problems with AWS is that it, billing alerts are great, but you need to have a cap on things because you can make mistakes. People do make mistakes. And AWS is pretty good about forgiving mistakes, but they don't have to be, and they aren't always. And I think that's a definite, definite issue there. All right, the last thing I want to talk about in security is object lock. And this is kind of a really cool feature of AWS that basically says, you can't delete files. You can't delete files ever, uh, or or for a certain period of time. Uh, and this really helps for compliance and regulatory issues. Basically, you can either specify a retention period, meaning like this file is not allowed to be deleted for 30 days, or a legal hold. Which And if you do a legal hold, that file, that object, cannot be removed no matter what unless the legal hold is removed. Um, so it's really, it's really pretty powerful. Um, it is enabled at the bucket level. You have to do everything in your in your bucket has to be uh, controlled by object lock, but you can override specific settings on a per file basis, which is also kind of nice. Um, so, um, and it's something to keep in mind with this is that, again, if you have a legal hold, because people are like, jump into this, like object lock, my users can't delete files, cool. Well, but if you put a legal hold on those files, um, you know, it's, it, you can't remove it, not even with a root account, unless you remove the legal hold first. So just keep that in mind. And and because this is a bucket setting, I feel now Cold Fusion 2021 allows you to turn on and turn off object lock via methods, which is cool. But I think it's the kind of thing, because it's at the bucket level, which is like a root object, a base object in S3, just like setting up a database, setting up a Lambda function, setting up a VPC, setting up a, a load balancer or a cloud front distribution. These are things that really should be done either in the console or better yet, uh, you know, in an infrastructure as code tool like CloudFormation or Terraform. You know, your core service configuration should really be done with, I think, infrastructure as code tools or ClickOps recording tools, something like that. Um, not necessarily in CF2020, you can do it, and CF 2021 allows you to do this. Um, but if you're going to do it in, in Cold Fusion directly, because people like to write just in Cold Fusion, that's fine, rather than doing it in CloudFormation or Terraform, which are their own domain-specific languages or DSLs. Um, but I would say do it in a setup script, and that's it, and that you never, you you know, don't touch very often. Um, it's not the kind of thing you want to be doing on a regular basis in your application. So anyways, uh, configuring an object lock on a file, again, same pattern. We get, um, uh, you get a reference to your bucket, and then you pass in the object lock request. You give it the key, which is the name of the file that you want to uh, manipulate and work on. And then you provide an object lock configuration. Uh, you enable object lock, and then you either provide default retention or a legal hold on it, depending on what you want. In this case, I'm saying we're doing a compliance retention for 30 days, and then I um, then run that object lock configuration on that object inside of S3. So yeah, that's what we do. So that's it for security. Right, we want to keep our stuff secure. It's a good thing. We want to do that. Uh, next up, let's talk about money and saving money. And this gets to the question of money, right? And we were just talking about that. Like, what if things go wrong? What if I spend a lot of money? Well, we all want to save money in cold in in a in all of our services, AWS, um, Cold Fusion, whatever. Uh, right, especially when it's on your pocket. So let's talk, and we can't talk about money in S three without talking first about storage classes. This is super important. And this is. This end and, and workflows or, or lifecycle workflows are the two ways that you can really save the most money realistically in AWS. You can't necessarily say users don't upload files. I mean, you can, but um, this is how you're going to save the money the most. So S3 has a lot of different storage classes. Um, I'm going to focus on the S3 side and not the S3 Glacier side. S3 Glacier is a service that Amazon provides that lets you store things for a long period of time um, with 
not a lot of access. Like Deep Archive, you would get the file back between eight and 12 hours after making the request, and you can only access it once a year. Flexible Retrieval, you can access it twice a year, and you get it back within seconds. And then, quote, Instant Retrieval, uh, I'm sorry, Instant Retrieval is you can only access it up to twice a year, uh, and you get it back in seconds. And Flexible Retrieval is you can um, access the file at any time, but it's between a one to 12 hour return time for the file. So that's for, it's really cheap and I'll show you prices later, but it's, that's, it's not what most of us are gonna be doing in our applications. Um, instead, I'm gonna focus on the store, the, the S3 storage classes. Standard is obviously the gold standard for AWS. It's where stuff goes by default. Intelligent tiering is a storage class where it looks at the usage of the object. And if it really hasn't been used at all in 30 days, it moves it from S3 standard to infrequent access. Um, and it, uh, there's some rules about S3 intelligent tiering, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it sort of does that work behind the scenes for you. Uh, standard infrequent access just means uh, it's instead of, instead of uh, sub millisecond response times, you're gonna get millisecond response times, uh, you know? Uh, so, and by millisecond response times, I mean like 10 to 20 milliseconds to get to the, the request to come back in your file to be retrieved, as opposed to sub millisecond response times in standard. Um, so it's not that big of a difference, and yes, Derek, yeah, it's it's uh, standard is where everything goes by default, but it's not necessarily the best place for everything, especially depending on how often it's used. And then finally, there's something called one zone in frequent access. So by default, when you upload a file into S3, it's automatically replicated to a minimum of three availability zones within a region. So th I mentioned regions before. These are the geographic regions around the world where AWS has its data centers. An availability zone in a region is a literal physical building separated by a certain distance from other buildings. That's, and they house thousands and millions of servers in there, virtual servers at least. Um, that's an availability zone. So when you put your file in S3, it automatically is replicated to uh, three availability zones within a region. If you don't wanna do that, and you're like, I don't really care if this file goes away, you can say, I will put it in a one zone in frequent access storage, which means it's not gonna be replicated to at least two other regions. Do you have to worry about that? Is that a problem at all? Um, well, no, I don't think so. Because let me take a moment to talk about durability in S3. Because again, this is one of the things people are worried about and concerned about with cloud storage. What if it blows up? What if it goes down? What if they lose my files? I gotta be responsible for this. No. S3 provides 11, not three, not five, but 11 nines of durability in geographically distributed storage, 11 nines. That's the equivalent of saying, um, you're 400 times more likely to get hit by a meteor than lose one of a million objects in S3. So 11 nines, it's bonkers, crazy durability right there. Um, there are formal proof of correctness algorithms that map across all the systems that S3 interacts with. They do checksums across these loosely coupled systems, including checking for bit slips in RAM, in memory, right? They have complex actuarial models that anticipate, anticipate when hard drives will fail. They have durability auditors that repeatedly crawl every byte of data in S3 to verify that when you retrieve your stuff, it's going to be correct. It is pretty amazing what they do in S3. If you really wanna get into uh, the sort of nitty gritty of this and learn a lot more about this, there's a great uh, video on YouTube from, I think it was uh, it was AWS reInvent uh, four years ago, I wanna say it's 2018, so four years ago, the head of S3 talked about this, like spent an hour just talking about the tech guts of S3. It's pretty incredible. So you don't have to worry about losing files. Is it technically possible Yes, it's technically possible you could lose a file, even in one, uh, one zone. The likelihood of your own servers, the hard drive in your own servers blowing up is about you know nine nines much more likely than losing something in S3. So don't be afraid of losing stuff in S3. In companies, the federal government, governments around the world, Amazon itself would not trust S3 if they lost stuff and it is incredibly durable and powerful. So let me talk about, right, as long as you pay the bills, as long as you pay the bills. Um, so let me talk about how easy it is to set the storage class, right? Um, again, you get your reference to your bucket. In the upload request, 
of when you're uploading a file, you say, this is the storage class I want it to go into, right? Provide a storage class attribute. And in this case, I'm saying standard 1A, IA. That's standard infrequent access, um, which makes it really easy when you upload the file to, uh, to move it into uh, that, that kind of storage. You don't have to use standard by default. Uh, and again, this is so easy. This is a lot less verbose than the AWS Java SDK uh, version, which is available, again, in my AWS Playbox app on GitHub, um, which is like 30 lines long to do the same thing. And yeah, John, it is absolutely always about trade-offs, always about trade-offs in terms of what you want to do, saving money. Um, but again, knowing that the fact that you can use different storage classes for many people is a revelation, especially in cold fusion. So that you're like, wait, I don't have to upload it to the most expensive thing. I can upload it and get, get great durability and great responsive times by using infrequent access. Cool. You know, that's a good thing. All right. So let me talk a little bit about costs. I've mentioned this a couple of times. Um, because cost is important, right? Cost determines your bill. Um, so for S3, again, I'm not going to talk about Glacier at all here, but you know, it's 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 point or it's 2.3 cents per gigabytes for the first ter 50 terabytes a month for standard storage. That's the gold standard there, and that's not bad. Yeah, it's just cost. Just ignore that. Um, intelligent tiering is cheap. Is the same for the first. Um, for the first 30 days, right? Because how intelligent tiering in the background works is it says, well, you got to keep it in an in intelligent in S3 standard for 30 days. And then afterwards, after 30 days, let's move it into, um, you know, infrequent access. Um, so it's still the same price. Plus you have a small overhead of about a penny per gigabyte per month where it's looking at all your files and saying, okay, are these ready to move over? Are these ready to move over? So for me, intelligent tiering sounds great. But it has the drawback of everything needing to be in S3 standard for a month, followed on top of this sort of monitoring cost. And also, S3 will not move files that are 100, smaller than 128K in size, kilobytes in size, from standard to infrequent access. It won't do it at all. So for me, intelligent tiering, I know some people love it. I'm not a big fan at all. I'm like, you know, do it in standard if you're going to have pretty high traffic on it. Otherwise, put it in frequent access because then it's only 1.2 cents per month per gigabyte. And that's really, really good. Uh, one zone in frequent access is, is a penny per gigabyte per month. And I get it. You know, people are like, well, you know, um, this is more expensive that I could, I could buy a RAID array of hard drives and it's going to be a lot less expensive than this, these prices. Well, you're not getting object lock, you're not getting security, you're not getting pre-signed URLs, you're not getting all the other things I'm going to talk about today. You're not getting any of those things. So keep in mind, and you're not getting the replicability and AWS's bandwidth and all that other stuff. So um, yeah, so it, it, it makes sense for me, I think, to there's a lot of reasons why cloud storage, whether it's Azure Blob storage or Google or AWS makes a lot more sense. Uh, right, and right, right, John, local drives don't account for distributed access or network issues or anything like that. So he asks, uh, if you have a 50 gigabytes on one class and you need to move it files to the other class, we have to pay if we want to upload it from local? Yes, if you decide to download and re-upload everything, but there's a way to get around that, and I'm going to talk about that. It's called um, what lifecycle workflows uh, that 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 can help you get around that sort of automatically, unless you want to use intelligent tiering. Intelligent tiering is really the only way to do it purely in S3 without setting anything up, just going by storage classes. Um, so Derek wants to know: Is it on bucket or key basis um, for storage costs? It's on an individual object. A storage is always on an individual uh, uh, object. Uh, S3 will default to standard storage. You have to specify that all the objects, each object as you put it up there into S3 is on in a different storage class. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it works. It's like S3 by default. I mean, sorry, standard by default, unless you say something else. So cloud storage is awesome. But you have to be careful and beware of egress, getting your data out of the cloud. This can bite you hard because AWS is happy and Google is happy and Oracle is happy to get your stuff into uh, their services and their systems, but they charge you for getting data out. NASA found this out the hard way. They did a, they put, um, it was back in 2018, they did, uh, they put in 32 petabytes of data for sort of open source, anyone can use it kind of three in S3. But as part of their grant, their funding and their budget forecasting, they kind of forgot that people would need or want to download these giant data sets. And they estimated that they would have to, they would, that there would be about 247 petabytes of downloads by 2025 from these data sets, from scientists using the data sets. That was going to cost them $30 million. 
which they did not account for in the in the in their in that. Yeah, and our, one of the reasons why people are so excited about Cloudflare's new R2 service that's currently in beta, as John said, is that it has no egress fees. And we're all hoping, we're all hoping this is going to force AWS to either significantly cut their egress fees or eliminate them altogether, which is great, which would be awesome for all of us. Cloudflare is doing a lot of really cool and interesting things. So for data in egress, consider CloudFront. CloudFront is AWS's global content delivery network. Um, it's not necessarily the fastest CDN or even some people say the best CDN, but it's oftentimes cheaper to go through CloudFront, which has over 500 points of presence around the globe. So it literally moves your files closer to the end user. We do a lot of video in my work at Johns Hopkins. I work for the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. We do a ton of video for our online classes and we wanna move those video files very close to our students in Kuala Lumpur or Beijing or Johannesburg or wherever they might be. So we use CloudFront to do that. And in an, an average month, like let's say, you know, let's say we do 4.6 terabytes of data through CloudFront, it costs us $406 a month to do that, right? And the same may seem like a lot, right? So it's on top of our storage in S3. S3 storage is different than CloudFront. But the data egress fees for that same 4.6 terabytes through S3 is $414. And that only diverges the more data you pull out of S3. CloudFront also has something called, they call it a security bundle, but really it's a pre-purchasing option where you save 20% off of your CloudFront costs. If you say up front, I'm gonna pay $200, then you get $240 of, of uh, costs bundled in that. So I'm saving 40 bucks right there, right? So CloudFront, is a really good way of getting your data closer to people. And it's often, once you reach a certain point, like four or five terabytes of data, um, you wanna make sure that you have, uh, you really look at CloudFront because those egress fees really start to add up after about four terabytes of data there. Yeah, you need money to move all those assets. But again, it depends on what your service is and how many people are using it, right? You know, we do uh, we do a lot of it. We do now, uh, the, you know, since COVID, we're doing, you know, eight, 10 terabytes a month through CloudFront. Um, we, it makes more sense than to run it through Cloud. It makes more sense to run it through CloudFront than our own network. And it makes our customers happier. So the other way you can save money is lifecycle flows. Lifecycle flows. And this is automatic archiving, automatic moving of files around, deletion of files, whatever it is. Because don't pay for files you don't need. Seriously, if you're storing log files and you only have to keep them for 30 days and you have log files from last year in S3, why? I mean, if you really don't need them for data analysis or anything like that, you've already done analysis on them, don't pay for things you don't need. Get rid of those files. So what lifecycle flows allow you to do is one of two things. One is called a transition action. And that allows you to say, after 90 days, move all files, all files in the last 90 days, move them to, that have been up recently, to infrequent access storage. So um, that's that's really great, right? There is, it's infrequent access storage, perfect. This is the question that came up earlier. Do I have to download and re-upload everything earlier, uh, upload everything again? No, add a lifecycle flow that does a transition action that says, if the file is more than 90 days old, move it over to infrequent access. Um, the other kind of lifecycle flow is known as an expiration action. So that basically says after 180 days, after 30 days, after 90 days, after 720 days, delete the file, right? in this bucket there. Um, so these are really powerful ways to save money in an automated way that's done in the background uh, without your without having to worry about it. So um, uh, the question is, what's the free option? Is there a free option? AWS does have a free tier. Uh, it is only valid for the first 12 months and it's kind of limited in the amount of data that can go out of S3. Uh, so if you're doing direct three S3 uh, egress, or I think the amount you can store is um, up to five gigabytes in S3, and your egress is one gigabyte during the the free tier. It's pretty minuscule. It's pretty it's pretty sucky to be honest. It's not very good the free tier. Um, but if you have a small website, um, it does work. Um, it does work for you. Um, I I run my blog off of S3 completely, and I pay I think it's eleven cents a month. And that's for my DNS name registration, something like that. So yeah, it's, uh, it, but I do, if you have a startup, by the way, as John mentions, uh, free is kind of bait and hook, absolutely. But if you have a startup, they provide, uh, it's something like 15 to $20,000 in startup credits uh, for you for your first year. Uh, so if you are a startup, look into their startup credits, yeah. Um, so uh, the question is, are these lifecycle flows retroactive? Absolutely. As soon as you apply a retro uh, lifecycle flow, AWS will start the counter and then say after 90 days or after 30 days or whatever it is, it's a minimum of 30 days, run the lifecycle flow and do it. So you can add it after the fact. Um, 
Can you use lifecycle flows to move files outside of the network? Um, you can only use them to move to a different storage class, either an S3 storage class or to um, uh, a Glacier. That's it. You can't move it to like a, uh, a hard drive or an elastic block store or something like that. So lifecycles are automatically done. They're automatically triggered. They, you, they, you set them up and they just run in the background. Um, if you're asking about, uh, can I do something when a file is uploaded to S3, the answer is yes, you can. Those would be Lambda listeners. You do an event listener on your bucket. And when any time a file is added to that bucket, it calls that Lambda function to process them. Uh, that's what that is. And I'm not really going to cover that today, but I was going to mention it later. So again, because lifecycle flows are applied at the bucket level, I suggest that you do this again. ColdFusion 2021 lets you do this, and it's kind of complicated. Um, but again, this is the kind of thing you want to do either in ClickOps in the console or doing using a tool like CloudFormation um, or Terraform there, yeah. Um, so Walter wants to know, is the data being physically moved or is it just a flag? So it's just a flag to be on. Well, no, actually, I take that back. It is being physically moved to different partitions within the S3 system um, because they prioritize S3 standard responses over um, um, other responses, like infrequent access responses in S3. That's controlled at the software level and maybe also partly at the hardware level. Um, so it is possible the files are being physically moved. You just never know. You don't know like the hard drive your files are stored on. It's like, you know, they just, you know, they just put it somewhere else for you. Yeah. So a couple things about lifecycle flows here. Um, set up a lifecycle rule to move your files to one zone in frequent access after 30 days. Seriously, instead of paying for the, um, uh, the management cost of intelligent tiering, make a lifecycle rule to do that. It does the same thing without the overhead, right? Does the same thing without the cost overhead. You have to set up the life lifecycle rule. It does have the same requirements. These rules don't go into effect. It's a minimum of 30 days in standard storage before these are applied, unless you start a file when you upload it in, in frequent access. Um, and also, there is this 128 kilobyte minimum file style uh, file size. It's still enforced for moving anything to an I in frequent access storage class. If you're doing a lot of really small files, you can't rely on lifecycle flows. You got to store those li those files when they're uploaded in infrequent access. Yeah. Um, and then if lifecycle flows sort of work, you can put predicates, say, only look for files that match this predicate across the entire bucket. Uh, so you could specify certain things within a bucket, um, but you can only have one of those. You can put filters on your lifecycle flows that say, if my object key has this path, like, you know, logs 2022, then run the lifecycle flow on that as well. So that's a better way of doing filtering there um, if you're going to use lifecycle flows. But they're super powerful. They're very easy to set up. They're super easy to set up either in the console. Well, the console makes it super easy to set up. Use them. This, I found, is the way we save the most money because a lot of times we deal with people uploading things who need them quickly, and then after 30 days, they're never touched again. So use lifecycle flows. They're awesome. All right. Wow, I'm going to run out of power time here. Power, powerful. Some things that S3 does that are kind of cool and very powerful that are built in. Versioning. S3 has super simple and rock solid versioning. You turn it on and it just works. Files get versioned. Now, versioning again is at the bucket level. So use CloudFormation or Terraform or the console to do this. And what happens is once you upload a file, in the response from uploading a file, S3 returns that version ID and the version ID property of that response object. And S3 will keep all the versions. So you upload the same file with the same file name. It'll keep all the versions for you. But you and your application are responsible for keeping track of what the versions mean. Versioning is not like Git or GitHub, where it shows you the difference. Ah, it simply keeps multiple versions of the files. You have to store the metadata that says, this is what version 7 means versus what version 8 means. But it's versioning you don't have to worry about. You turn it on, it just works, and you go with it. So it's really easy, then, if you want to get all the versions of an object, um, again, very easy to do it in ColdFusion 2021. You give the path to the file, and then you say, my bucket, list all versions. So again, in ColdFusion 2021, these functions work on, the, or the methods work on the bucket level, not the individual object level. So you have to provide that prefix. If you don't provide the prefix, it gets all versions of all files in your bucket, and that could be a very large and very bad request that you don't want to have there, right? Ah, so. Um, Drew wants to know, if you remove the files, did versioning also get removed? That is a great question. And the answer is no. No, they do not get removed. So you pay for every version, 
right? It's, it looks like it, just another object in S3 to S3. So you pay for every version and older versions are kept even when you suspend versioning, right? So if you remove the files, it will then also keep the older versions as well because to S3, they look like different objects. So you're going to pay, right, exactly. You pay for each time the file is uploaded. For some people, this is great because they don't have to worry about versioning and compliance and things like that. So you, what you want to do is set a lifecycle rule to have old versions expire after N days. That's the way to do it. That is really the only way to get rid of old versions of files because when you delete the most recent version of the file, it's just like some other random object being deleted out of S3. So you want to make sure that you have that lifecycle rule set up. Otherwise, you keep everything forever and ever. Amen. That's great for some people, but not for most of us humans who have to pay reasonable bills. So versioning is cool. Just those are the cautions with it. And then the last thing I want to talk about from a power kind of perspective is tags. So tags are awesome. Tags are a way of finding things in AWS, not just S3, in a human readable way. And tags are great. If you aren't using tags, start looking at them. Aside from pre-signed URLs, start using tags. Seriously, if, you, if you're going to do that. Um, and really, there's key value pairs. Key value pairs. You can say, like, have tags that focus on what business group this is, some of the technical things about it, if it's an EC2 instance or a Lambda function, security things about that file or whatever it is. They're just key value pairs. That's all that they are. You can come up with any kind of tags that you want. And you could have up to 10 tags per object in S3 or up to 10 tags on an EC2 instance instance or a Lambda function or an application load balancer, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I know. When you tell a CF developer to use tags, right? It's like, write your code and script, right? If you're in your cold fusion code and script. But in AWS, you want to use tags on everything. Exactly. Um, so here's how you can add tags to objects um, you know, with S3. So you basically in your, you make in, uh, you do an, uh, you get a reference to the bucket. And again, because S3 methods in ColdFusion 2021 only apply to the bucket object, not individual objects. You have to apply, you have to specify the key, and then you pro uh, prov provide an array of tags. That's all. And you can see a key value, key value. That's all they are, is key value things. Um, and you want to specify the object where the tags get assigned. And again, this is about being able to find stuff later on. And that's super useful and valuable when it comes to things like, you know, um, uh, billing, right? And who did what? And who used what? And how much of the data is being used by these people? Um, so the thing about tags is that you, 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 there's some, you have to have a strategy. Come up with a strategy and stick with that strategy when it comes to tagging. So there's a couple of really good tagging guides. AWS and their docs actually has a really good guide to tagging. But the one that I, I use that I like a lot, I think is really very well written, very well considered, not overwhelming, not in all business speak, um, is there's a, a tagging guide on caninesecurity.io, really good tagging guide that helps you think about some of the things you might want to use tags for in your AWS activities and S3 in particular. So tags are a good thing. They'll help you find when you're like, wait, who upload, what group was responsible for uploading that file or what team did, you know, started that EC2 instance or my favorite, who set up a V who set up this VPC and all these security groups. And I don't have no idea what this is. Use tags. It'll help you find things makes a huge difference there. All right. So there's a bunch more that you can do with S3 and Cold Fusion 2021 or the AWS Java SDK that I simply didn't have time to cover today. You can do website hosting. Right? This is great for your static or Jamstack sites. My blog uh, is, is, uh, is a Jamstack site. It's a, a, a rendered via Jekyll, and I just uploaded to S3. It does all my website hosting for me. It's literally a click of the button. Literally click the button. Um, S3 can be used as a database. This is something else I've gotten into. There's an amazing tool called Amazon Athena that allows you to run SQL queries against structured data in S3. If you have 15 petabytes of CSV files and, and they have a similar sort of structure, you can run SQL queries against those CSV files or JSON files or log files, any kind of structured text. It's amazing and awesome. I'm someday going to do a whole presentation just on Athena because it's really powerful because there's a lot of logging. So, so many companies don't use S3 for images or documents. They store their logging data. They are their customer metrics. And you can query that structured data with Amazon Athena. There's another tool called S3 Select that makes you look at one file instead of across all millions or thousands or hundreds of files. S3 Select lets you query a single file, again, as long as it's structured, CSV, JSON, whatever, um, and then query that using SQL. It's awesome. 
S3 events, I was mentioning this a little bit earlier. So um, the it, this lets you set up a Lambda listener, a Lambda serverless function that will fire every time you drop a function into a bucket. So if you have an image bucket and you're like, well, I want to make a you know five different versions of this image for different sizes, different browsers, different responsiveness, you can just run a Lambda function that does that, all sorts of things. Uh, S3 batch is a tool that lets you run Lambda functions on files that already exist in your S3 bucket. So you can say, well, we just got this new requirement where we have to like make PDFs of all the Word documents that we have. Well, you can run S3 batch and a Lambda function to do that on files that already exist, whereas Lambda listeners are for files that are just coming in. Uh, Drew wants to know, um, is there an additional cost for this S3 as a database? Uh, yes, in the sense that you pay for the amount of data that you query. It's five cents a terabyte um, of data. So if you're looking at Per, so ever is yeah five cents of ter of terabyte of data that's scanned. There are ways of partitioning your data so you can say like I only want to look at the month of May. It's all it has to do with the file names, but you can partition that down so you're not querying petabytes of data, but instead maybe gigabytes of data. So yeah, it's not it's not terribly pricey, but it can add up as I've discovered the hard way. Um, more security things. You can require MFA on delete, which is kind of cool. Um, you can do something called named access points. So you can say like. Instead of the bucket name, you can say uh, this path inside this bucket gets the name Brian's files. And you can write references in your code to Brian's files instead of that S3 bucket and the path there. Um, you can do attribute-based attribute uh, access control. So you can say, like, this bucket is for people who have um, in their IAM roles, they have an attribute of developers, right? So only developers can access that bucket or what have you. Um, so there's more security thing. Replication. You can automatically do cross-region replication, where you literally say, with a click of a button, it's one button, copy all of my data in real time from this bucket in US East 1 to you know, um, AP1, Asia Pacific 1. And it will do the work for you in the background. You pay double, right? Because you're paying for the content in both things, um, both places. But it's automatic replication across the globe, which is kind of cool. Um, there's something called data sync. So if you want to sync, if you're if you're like, okay, I think it's time we move all of our petabytes of data or terabytes of data from our local data center to S3, there's a tool called data sync that does that in the background and helps you and, and sort of migrates the data in real time as you once you get to that point of doing the initial migration. It's it's very, very handy. And finally, there's something called requester pays. So that another IAM, another AWS user. If you have clients who also have AWS accounts, AWS accounts, you can say if they're pulling stuff out of my bucket, they're paying for the data egress. And this can be really useful if you have a limited number of clients. This doesn't work with the general public, obviously. But you're like, OK, I'm a video production house, and you guys need the videos that I've created. So you're going to pay for all that data coming out. And you're going to give me your AWS credentials to do that. And you're going to get charged for that data egress there. Um, MFA as owners, yeah, yeah. So for MFA, yeah, it is limited to an, a specific IAM user and all that other good stuff. Right, so you don't pay for the data transfers. You just pay for the fact that your stuff sits in S3. I mean, you still pay for the storage in S3. You're just not paying for the data egress in that case. But again, it's really hard to do for like you know customers on your website. This would be something you have some big clients and they're pulling a lot of data. They can pay for pulling that data. OK, so that's it. Hopefully, I've inspired you a little bit around some of the power that S3 has above and beyond just storing files. It's a complex beast. It's a powerful beast. It's an amazing beast. And go out. Try this stuff out. Set up your lifecycle rules. Go do that right now. You can do that in the console. Start using pre-signed URLs. The more you use the service, and, and again, all these things Cold Fusion 2021 lets you have access to. Do them. They're powerful. Um, they're great. And they will save you a lot of money and make your services you're able to provide on S3 a lot greater for your clients, no matter who they are. So here's my contact information, my name, my email, my Twitter. My blog is briankloss.net. I'll post a copy of these slides up there. I'm pretty sure that the Adobe team is also going to post a copy of all the recordings and slides somewhere. The AWS Playbox app, again, it's designed for Cold Fusion 2018 and earlier. But if you are using 2018 and earlier, or you want to learn more about AWS Java SDK for using other services like, I don't know, like, like Athena. Like if you want to use Athena from your Cold Fusion apps, you'd have to use the Java SDK right now. Um, it has lots of examples. 
you can use that and play with it. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm sometimes on the CFNL Slack. I'm most of the time on Twitter, uh, but you can definitely do that as well um, if you want to reach out to me. And, and I just want to mention, I think the very first person who asked a question or made a, uh, um, Brian, good, uh, a comment. Question. Oh, yeah. Hi. So there are a couple of questions in the Q&A pod. Oh, uh, yeah, sure, please. Let me, uh, can I pull that up? No, I can't. Should I stop sharing, uh, Kishore? Uh, yes. Okay. I will do that. So I can see the Q&A pod. All right, let's see. Um, all right, so uh, Zoltan wants to know about the best practice is to not include secret keys and stuff in the code itself. Absolutely. In your application C or whatever, because it gets committed to version control. Now, yeah, you don't want to put your keys in your code. That's like your IAM keys, your access key, your secret key. I could talk for a long time about this. There are solutions for this. Uh, Brian B., uh, who gave a talk on Wednesday about using key management store or secrets manager, that's generally what most people recommend. In AWS is actually use secrets manager uh, to do that. Uh, if you're running your code inside of AWS. There are other ways of doing it. You could do it in environment variables. You can do it at uh, command line uh, options. Uh, you can pass those in. You can do it in the, the JRE configuration. Just don't put it in your code. Um, so if you're running in AWS, the best way to use to do is use Secrets Manager. If you're running outside of AWS, I would suggest either environment var variables or command line arguments that are passed to uh, your Java configuration to pass in your access and secret keys. That's what I would suggest. Um, uh, Aminesh wants to know if there's a new CF release around this. I mean, I'm sure I know that the Adobe team is working on a new CF release. I don't know what um, uh, uh, AWS is doing in terms of, I mean, what they're doing in terms of any additional AWS integration. And I don't think there's any, any announcement on that. Um, AES, is it possible to allow an asset being only displayed when it's called on a web page and to block the view when load is, is being accessed directly in a browser? Not that I'm aware of. Because AWS behind the scenes, all requests are just HTTP requests. That's all. They All that fancy stuff that gets done is just with the SDK, no matter what the language, with the cold fusion integration, behind the scenes at its core, it's just a... Um, uh, it's just an HTTP request. That's all that it is. So you can't really block that, unfortunately, if it's being loaded directly in the browser. Um, John wants to know, do S3 features work with other compatibles S3 solutions? Um, I don't believe in Cold Fusion 2021 they do, um, because again, you're, it's, that's tied directly to AWS or GCP, uh, sorry, AWS or Azure uh, there. Um, there are other companies that are like, like R2, which you mentioned, which is coming from Cloudflare, their storage, their API will be S3 compatible. So theoretically, you could swap that out on the back end. Um, let's see. Uh, AES, should we pre-sign URLs of all the assets loaded in the DOM to expire each week to avoid others using your resources? Will that not be too much server cost? Um, the signing of the URLs is pretty simple and pretty straightforward. I have yet to see any performance impact from that. Um, as Brian, the other Brian was mentioning in his talk, the biggest overhead with AWS is establishing that connection, doing the handshaking. Once that connection is there and open in your AWS server, I mean, your Cold Fusion server, the response times are minimal. I mean, it is shocking how fast responses come back from, from AWS for things like pre-signed URLs. Well, actually, that's done via the SDK locally. I take that back. So the pre-signed URL generation is done via the AWS SDK locally. So it's done inside your Cold Fusion runtime, inside of memory. So it's extremely fast right there. Um, are there additional costs for encryption at rest? No. No. There are no additional costs for encryption at rest, which is wonderful. Uh, absolutely. Um, So Zoltan was asking about encryption at rest, uh, protecting against the data being stolen without my credentials. Wouldn't stolen credentials allow someone to read and decrypt everything? Yes, they would. So if they had your credentials, they would allow you to do that. If it's the same set of credentials as you use to write uh, to that S3 bucket, again, this is why you want to have very limited credentials or limited permissions for each set of credentials in AWS. And that's it's a complex challenge, right? Permissions, users, management. Um, you want to you're going to end up with a lot of different roles or lots of lots of different users, as it were, uh, that can do a bunch of limited things, right? This thing does the PDF service. This thing does you know file management in S3. This thing does querying Athena. You have lots of users or roles in S3 or in AWS, excuse me. And that's complicated to manage, but in case somebody steals one of those credentials, they can't unencrypt your files. So yes, uh, if they were to get the same credentials you use to upload the files, they could see the files and the contents of those files there using the built-in SSE S3 storage. That's where you'd want to say, okay, I don't want that, so I want um, 
um, I want, uh, you know, to use my own key or use my own hardware even to do that stuff. Um, so Brian asked, just does uploading from the browser to FCF and saving to S3 via the native functions or using the Java SDK use the same amount of resources that saving a file to local file systems uses? Um, so uh, yes, it does. It's if if you're using CF file or file upload function, again, what's going to happen is that Cold Fusion is going to upload the file to the Cold Fusion server and then put it on S3, right? Or you have to do CF file to do that and and bring the file locally to your Cold Fusion server, then use the S3 file upload command to upload that to S3. Um, really, that's why you want to use the pre-signed put request because that avoids uploading the file to your CF server. So you know S3 can by default accept files from you know, one kilobyte all the way up to five terabytes. And if you have people who need to upload very large files that are gigabytes in size, you're going to want to do those direct pre-signed puts to S3 because that doesn't cause your Cold Fusion server to, to die, right? Because it's going to use up so much RAM, your CF server is probably going to run out of RAM if you're trying to upload like a one terabyte file. It just doesn't uh, work great that way. I mean, maybe you can configure a CF server to do that. I don't. I've never tried because I don't think that's a good use of the CF server. So have AWS do that instead with those pre-signed puts, if that makes sense. All right. Um, that's it for me, unless there's more questions that'll come in. Oh, I know I need to give out the $100. Doo -doo -doo, very exciting. Uh, the $100 gift card. So uh, I think the first person who asked that question in and then asked a bunch more in um, uh, in, in the Q&A pod uh, was Zoltan. So Zoltan Radnai. So if, Kishore, you want to... Uh, reach out and follow up with that person for the $100 gift card. Thank you for your excellent questions. Thank you, everyone, for the excellent questions. Oh, there's a few more uh, in there. Um, so Brian wants to know, um, is, do I have any suggestions for uploading directly to S3 from the browser and then notifying CF that it's happened? Yes. So this is pretty straightforward to do. Um, when you do a file upload using like the fetch method in JS, uh, it'll tell you when it's done. And if you already have like on the back end done, like so what we do in our apps is it's a three-step process. One, we make an Ajax call to our servers, our Cold Fusion servers, and we say uh, generate a pre-signed URL to do the file upload, do a pre-signed put URL. Uh, we then return that to the browser. So and then that and then the fetch. The, in JavaScript, in JavaScript runtime, fetch uses that pre-signed URL, the pre-signed put to actually put the file on S3. When it gets returned back, then it makes another call to our Cold Fusion server saying, the file was successfully uploaded. Here's any additional data we need to do. And that way, I know the file's been uploaded to S3. Are there points of failure for there? Possibly. Absolutely. There's always points of failure when you're dealing with asynchronous calls. But that's the simplest and I think most straightforward to do that um, there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the way that I would do it. That's the way we do it. We do it a lot with pre-signed puts in our apps and we upload, you know, people upload, you know, four, five, 10 gigabyte files all the time and we never have problems. Uh, how will quantum computers change all this? I have no idea. I have zero interest in quantum computing right now in my life. Uh, AWS does offer a quantum computing service, but it has no interest for me. It's all theoretical. Um, Kevin wants to know about Athena. Can you do joins on different structured data? Yes, you can, sort of. So what would happen in that case, Kevin, is there's another tool in AWS, always another tool called uh, AWS Glue, Glue. And what it is, Glue is a system that lets you crawl your data or look at your data and define virtual tables tables, like SQL tables, like you'd have in a SQL or a relational database out of that. And you can say, OK, Glue, we're going to define one table from this kind of data and another table, there we go, from this kind of data. And we can do joins across those tables once they are actually defined inside of Glue. And then Athena can say, you can say, tell Athena to look at Glue and be like, hey, you're going to use that instead. Uh, and yes, XML is OK for Athena uh, as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of a, a cool thing that is available to you uh, as well in Athena. That's why I think, I think Athena is great. And maybe I really should do a presentation on that as well. Um, OK. Oh, Zoltan said, give it to someone else. All right, well, then I am going to give it to um, the very first person who asked a question in the general chat, I think. And I think that was, who was the very person? Well, John was asking, about, was it John? Yeah. Uh, so John was the very first person who, John Farrar asked the very first question in this sort of general chat, not sort of sarcastic one, uh, that was there about making everything public. Um, so let's, let's, so John Farrar is the, is the hundred dollar winner for today's session. Thank you, John. And you asked great questions. I mean, a lot of people did. These are awesome questions. You can tell I love talking about AWS. I love presenting on it. I love working with it. It really inspires me as a developer. I've been doing this for a long time. You can see all the gray hair there. And I've been doing software development and CFL, CFML development for almost 20 years, uh, CFML in particular. Before that, it was like, you know, 
Pearl and CGI gateways and fun things like that. And then Assembler back in the day and Basic on my Atari 800. Uh, AWS still inspires me. I love it. And you can see that passion. Um, so uh, try to find that passion yourself. And it's great because you can use CF, Cold Fusion, to build out so many of the sort of like core business logic services, but rely on AWS services to do really cool things that you would not have the time or scale or resources to build yourself. So I will wrap it up there. Uh, and so thank you all for attending. Have a great rest of your day. Feel free to follow up with me with individual questions. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here. Have And there's one more presentation come up from Mike Brunt. Mike is amazing and super smart, one of the smartest people I've ever met. Uh, so uh, you know, don't take him for granted. Check out that session. It'll definitely be a good one. And I'll say thank you and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, Brian. This was an amazing session. Uh, we have our last session coming up in another two hours, 20 minutes. Uh, looking forward to seeing all of you there. Bye.